Well, welcome, Professor Sharon Anne Liu, who's Matthew Flinders Distinguished Professor in the College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences and Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. Thank you so much for coming and having a conversation with me today. This uh, conversation is organised by the Centre of Law and Society here at Cardiff School of Law and Politics. So welcome. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you for making me feel so welcome. I'm looking forward to our conversation this morning. I am too. Um, I know you're going to talk to us this evening about judging an emotion. So we'll come back to that if you don't mind at the end of this conversation, and hopefully it might pervade the whole way through. But before we get there, I'd love for you to tell us something about your career trajectory, how you ended up in the sociology of law. That's a really interesting question, and I guess I wonder how far one wants to go back in time. Uh, but I guess I'll start with my years as an undergraduate at the University of Tasmania, which is an island state of Australia. And I decided that I wanted to go to university after graduating from school, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I just kind of drifted into a Bachelor of Arts. And sociology was being offered for the first time ever uh, at the university and there was a very dynamic professor who'd come from Canada to set up the sociology program. So I thought, well, I'll give sociology a try and if I don't like it, I can drop it and go back to history and English. So I became fascinated by sociology. I'd always been interested in law uh, and I think probably my interest in the sociology of law hadn't really developed at that point, but I'd always been interested in law. And I remember um, at school, this wasn't really a career opportunity for women in my time. I know it, it's not the 19th century, it's not that long ago, uh, but kind of jobs that were expected for women to do apart from their roles as potential wives and mothers were things like teaching and nursing. So uh, it, it was actually discouraged for me to do law. People say, well, why do you want to be in that, you know, all those books and those boring court cases, why would you want to do that? I thought, okay, why would I want to be in a boring library for the rest of my life? So I set off on sociology and a lot of the great sociologists talked about law, for example, Max Weber, Durkheim, even Marx. And so I became interested in how can we understand the role of law, the place of law, the situation of law within a broader social context. So after my undergraduate degree, I um, did a master's in Tasmania and then decided to go to the US to do my PhD. And there I kind of ended up doing, and when I say ended up, I mean, I'm not sure what the precise steps were, but I was interested in women, I was interested in work and employment, I was interested in law, and I was interested in sociology. So putting all those pieces of that jigsaw together, uh, I did a PhD looking at women in the legal profession in the US. I was committed to empirical research, so I wanted to go out and do my own research. I wasn't very interested in uh, dealing with large data sets. I remember uh, at the University of Tasmania there was someone who was really into quantitative analyses and in those days he would walk around with a stack of cards, the old computer cards. I'm not really interested in in you know correlations and multiple regressions and just sitting in front of a computer um, you know doing uh, statistical manipulations. I want to go out and talk to people, I want to interview people, I am really interested in doing research in the field. So I think that first experience of talking to people, asking questions, thinking about how law works in everyday life, thinking about how lawyers go about their work uh, in a particular context were all things that um, really interested me as well as the kind of research approach kind of suited me I guess mm. I mean some people are much more happy to be working with secondary data sets with large numbers and statistical analyses others like to be out in the field doing court observations or interviews or um, you know interacting with people as they are enacting their everyday life and work now I can keep going, Rachel. Yeah, but, but your interest, you, you your may interest have <laughs> other questions. Well, your interest was clearly in the lived experience of this, of the lived experience of female lawyers in America at that point in time. Sure, and and also the the idea of the profession. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just the 
um, the women and men. I mean, one of the things I was really clear on, um, I was certainly interested in women in the legal profession, but I also wanted to know how and why is that different to men? Uh, so when I did my interviews in the US, which and I looked at um, lawyers, corporations, in, yeah. in business corporations, so in financial corporations as well as industrial corporations. So I looked at in-house uh, legal departments and I was really interested in the similarities and differences between men and women rather than just assuming that women's experience would be necessarily completely different to men's and vice versa. I really just wanted to know what is it like, uh, what are some of the issues and challenges, particularly for the profession. Mm. So I think that's a golden thread that runs through my research is an interest in the profession, how professions are organised, how they recruit members, why are some people excluded and others included. Uh, I was at university at a time of the first big influx of women into law schools around the globe, really, uh, or at least around the Commonwealth uh, and common law um, world. So that previously there had been very few women who had become lawyers. And so I was interested in not what is about those women or about women in general that means they don't become lawyers, but to turn that question around and ask what is it about the profession and the way the profession is organised, which means it is not um, accessible to segments of the population. So I was not so much interested in why people do X or Y or not, but what is it about these larger institutional forces which mean that some people end up uh, in particular kinds of jobs and others do not? And that's a theme that's run through your work since your time in America, has it not? This it idea of the gendered experience and how the lived experience and the professionalisation of magistrates has been your most recent work. Yes, and, and certainly in Australia, many magistrates were part of the public service. Mm -hmm. And so in fairly recent years, and I know I have to be careful when I say recently, <laughs> uh, but you know, in the past 40 years or so, that has, has changed and have become fully independent judicial officers, different to magistrates in England and Wales, as uh, magistrates in Australia are trained lawyers and they're mm -hmm. um, Judicial, have judicial independence and security of tenure and they are not public servants but there has been a, a move to make them more like judicial officers with stronger guarantees around judicial independence um, than have, has been in the past and really that thread of professions has led me on to thinking about the judiciary more widely and in the research that I've done in the past 20 years, it's been uh, in collaboration with my colleague, Professor Kathy Mack, who's at the law school at Flinders University. And we've been involved in looking at the judiciary really as an occupation, as a professional occupation over the past decade and a half. So rather than seeing the judiciary as this mystical <laughs> status, uh, we have looked at the judiciary by using fairly well-known sociological concepts like job satisfaction, um, career trajectories, biographies, uh, social class, ethnicity, looking at uh, judicial officers from those kinds of dimensions, as well, most recently, as you, you mentioned, mm. the emotions and emotion work in the context of the judiciary, which uh, until recently people didn't really think or talk about emotion work in that particular occupational space. And your work does look at the judiciary as individuals and as humans within that context, but it also looks at the the structures that limit or enable their functions within within the magistrates' courts. There's quite a lot that you've written about how much they their caseload, how that impacts and the application of justice or how it's perceived. And there's the kind of multifaceted nature of the magistrates is a really kind of central theme to all your work that you're doing now. Yes, yes, it has been. And I think people 
forget, I think, or perhaps don't realise that the lower courts in most countries deal with most of the cases. So in Australia, the magistrates courts, which are the lower courts, although I should say in some jurisdictions they're called the local court, but let's say the lower courts in Australia deal with over 95% of all criminal matters that come into the court system and around about 90% of all civil matters that come into the court system at all. So a lot happens at that court level. And for the ordinary citizen, that is, if they're going to have contact with any aspect of the court system, it is more than likely going to be at that level, at the lower court level. So that translates into quite busy courtrooms. And for magistrates who'd like to approach their job somewhat differently, and I've talked in interviews with many magistrates who want to do things a little bit differently, don't want to be the detached, removed, wooden-faced judicial officer, but want to have some more engagement, ask questions directly of defendants, even if they are legally represented, uh, hear about their stories, try and be more reflexive, and actually, as, as, as some have labelled it, try and be a little bit more problem-solving. Uh, but that is really limited by the vast numbers of cases that they must make decisions about on any one day and also their resources, their capacities to do things or know about what happens when someone walks out of the courtroom door. So I think it's a very um, challenging role, uh, especially in the lower courts, because magistrates are often seeing I like to think of them as kind of downstream. They are seeing things that are the consequences of institutional failures further upstream. Mm. Failures perhaps of the education system, of the labour market, of housing, of welfare, um, so that they are seeing a lot of people for whom the legal issue or the legal problem or the offence is just one aspect of a panoply of social, socio-economic problems. And so it's very difficult to carve out, like, this is the legal problem, this is the legal issue, without being aware of the context, of the background, of the reasons somebody might have ended up in court. Now, that can take a lot of time to try and uh, do that kind of individually and, and find out someone's story and trajectory. Uh, and is very frustrating because magistrates uh, may may make an assessment that somebody needs X, Y, or Z, but that's not available. So I think it's a very it can be a very challenging job. And I remember um, kind of early on in our interviews with magistrates, one said, and it's really a quote that's stuck in my mind, that uh, you know he sees um, the parade of misery day in day out. And there was, he said that there were two things that could happen. You could grow a skin as thick as a rhino, or you just kind of are overwhelmed by the human um, tragedy that, you, that you're seeing. And I, he didn't really articulate a third way. It leads us beautifully to the, what you're speaking about tonight, which is this idea of the emotional labour of the judge, the fact that they not only deal with the emotions that are presented to them in the court, of the defendants and families and everybody else who's present in the court, but also their own emotions within this context. And that's the main theme of your talk tonight, is it not? Yeah, yes, it is. And it, it was quite interesting. Um, we conducted surveys uh, that had a little bit of information and data about emotion and emotion mm. work. And then we wrote a paper in the 2000s which looked at emotional labour in the magistrate's court. But this topic has kind of come back and really was a strong theme in some interviews that I undertook with judges and magistrates about how they manage their own feelings and how they think about what they're doing uh, and making decisions in quite difficult cases, being ex exposed to challenging uh, evidence and how they put their emotion or how they recognise emotions, how they think about them. And many would say they can put them aside, uh, that once they have thought about their feelings, that they need to then 
um, invoke really what they they do is is invoke the image of the judicial officer as dispassionate and almost the embodiment of law mm -hmm. and talk about I must put my emotions aside. I need to be impartial. Impartiality is is um, reflected in mm -hmm. the judicial oath, and a sense that they are able to do this. Uh, there's also other emotions. I mean, often when we think about emotions, we think about the uh, so-called negative emotions or the really visible emotions that are that are embodied, like anger and frustration mm -hmm. and annoyance. But they also experience a lot of other emotions like satisfaction, doing a good job, loyalty and commitment can all be feelings about how they approach um, their job as judicial officers. So do you create a distinction in your work between the emotions they experience themselves and the emotions that they have to manage within that courtroom? Um, okay, so in terms of um, the emotion work that judges and magistrates do. I, I first should say that it, it is different depending on the court yeah. context. So the different uh, courts will present different kinds of opportunities and demands for emotion work. And I guess much of our work has been at the level of the lower courts, but not all. So in the round of interviews that I did, we talked with both judges and magistrates. Now, uh, sometimes, um, you know, you can make a, a, a clear-cut distinction between the emotions of others and the emotions that I'm feeling, but sometimes they're really connected because perhaps the way in which others are behaving or um, the emotions that they're experiencing can trigger emotions in the judicial officer. So they're kind of connected, uh, and it depends on... Uh, you know where the you know the relationship. I guess I want to really focus on the relationship to understand emotions, because we often think about emotions as in court as really only involving defendants and lay people. But perhaps um, some might say they don't know how to behave in court. They're not aware of the protocol or the decorum, uh, and that really it's a place of constraint, and everybody needs to manage their emotions. Mm -hmm. And we might say, well, you know, when you talk about emotion work and emotions in court, well, really, you're thinking about defendants, aren't you? Well, actually, sometimes, but sometimes not. Certainly in the higher courts, uh, judges talk to me about the emotions of the barristers and the way they behaved, um, from prosecution to defence, rattling each other, uh, perhaps bullying the witnesses, a very and um, perhaps being rude to the judge, which I know sounds kind of odd, but it does happen. Uh, and that judges having to manage their feelings about how they personally feel about particular barristers or lawyers, so that it's not just restricted to, uh, let's say, um, people call uh, sometimes um, defendants or, and lay people in court as one-shotters, mm -hmm. you know, people outside the courtroom work group uh, and people who are, are not there every day. But there's certainly a lot of emotion work and emotion experiences among what might be called the courtroom work mm -hmm. group. So very much a shared uh, experience. It's a, it's a relational experience, this emotion. It's not individual. It's not isolated to one. Yeah, and, and I think my kind of sociological perspective on emotion is to think about it as a relationship that in order for emotion to emerge, it emerges in response to something and it often emerges in response to something somebody else has said or done. So as soon as you've got someone else in the equation, you've got a, some kind of relationship. So I, I try to think about emotion as about relationships and not about just the individual experience that someone has also to kind of branch out a little bit more in terms of, of the social interpretation of emotion, to have certain kinds of emotions require some interpretation and some language. All of these are, cert, uh, are social things. Um, and I just had another thought around emotion. There are, all, uh, yes, there are also rules about how to, and these are social, I mean, we might, have a sense that there's the right kind of emotion to display and the wrong kind of emotion to display. And there are certain rules, many of them are informal, they're tacit, they're just kind of 
understood. And, and certainly uh, last week I was here at the um, University of Cardiff at a workshop on remorse. And that was one of the issues that people talked about, expectations of what displaying remorse looks like. Mm. So, and these are social. These, these expectations aren't just made up every day, starting afresh. They exist in a kind of cultural repertoire, in a sense, of, of a normative environment. But I presume those kind of constraints of social rules apply differently sometimes to defendants who are defendants in person, who have less understanding of the context within which they work, or those kind of constraints within that legal system there. Ingenues, they've never been there before. Mm -hmm. And so I presume within the magistrate's court, you may have more overt uses of emotion within that court system and that the justices are more have to engage with far more extremes of emotion that you would see than you would see in those higher courts. Yeah, yeah, I, I, from the defendant, certainly, yes. um, the, the kind of emotion expression. But by and large, um, you know, in, in terms of our court observations, by and large, um, defendants don't show much emotion at all. Yes. So sometimes when we talk about emotion, mm. it's uh, um, there's a lot of emotion work, perhaps, to maintain that demeanour of emotionlessness. So just to say that someone is expressing a demeanour without emotion doesn't... It's not the same as saying they don't have any emotion. They may be hard at work managing that emotion to display a demeanour of neutrality, uh, and that goes for the defendant as well as the magistrate. So there is emotion work in maintaining uh, a, a demeanour of emotionlessness, which most, and, and certainly in our court observations in the magistrate's court, things happen very fast yeah. so there may yeah. not be an opportunity to display emotion and in our observations were of non-trial matters so we did not observe trials which is where you might expect mm. to see more emotion uh, particularly on the um, part of witnesses but certainly in, in some of the interviews magistrates talked about um, hearing victim impact statements uh, and people in court being upset, court staff being upset, and the magistrate being upset. And one of the magistrates I interviewed said, you, you've just got to let it all, you just have to let all the emotion. So there's this idea, there's the concept that emotion is something inside and that you've got to let it come to the outside, let it all kind of get itself worked mm -hmm. out. And she used the term, let the silt settle. Yes. Let, let the silt settle and then, she said, I'm in the right place to make my decision. So it's almost let all the emotion come through, let's put it to the side, now I'm in a space for rational decision making. So impassionate, impassionate decision making. And too, yes, impassionate, detached, yeah. uh, almost the embodiment of law, but recognising that emotion is appropriate, mm -hmm. that this was not a good idea for the magistrate to say, okay, uh, we've had enough now, mm. we need to move on, I'm busy, you know, we've got, mm. we've got a huge list we need to get through. She recognised that that was not appropriate, uh, but that she needed to take the time. And in the end, um, perhaps that was a sense of procedural justice. Yeah. That uh, if people feel that they've had an opportunity to say what they wanted to say and feel that the magistrate has listened and that other people have listened, um, that, that they then might be more accepting of, of an outcome. And the idea that, that, that the release of emotion is just part of that process to yeah. fairness and justice. Yes, yes. That... Is that a generalised acceptance within the court or was there a huge difference between the different members of the, mag the magistrate on how they dealt with, in your courtroom observations, how they dealt with motion, whether they shut it down, whether they allowed it to come freely? Was there... But there was some variety. I, I think, um, by and large, uh, you know, work in the magistrate's court and um, decision making is fairly businesslike and routine. So these are kind of unlike that more businesslike and routine um, mainstream, and that's kind of mostly what happens. 
there were, in the interviews, um, there's a variety mm-hmm. of, of views about the role of emotion. Um, there, there were quite a few examples of um, magistrates and judges who might use humour to manage emotion, to kind of make it a more human experience. There are others who see very clear boundaries between what they're doing and and any kind of emotion. I remember one other uh, interview where a male magistrate said, well, my role is not to sit there and empathise with them. I'm the judicial officer. I'm the making the decision. But then he did soften that and say, but it doesn't do any harm to show that I've been affected by what's going on. So there some have a very clear... A boundary about what the role of the judge is and what the role of others is mm. and I, I again I remember it's interesting what you remember from early um, days of a piece of research early on in our um, study of magistrates courts kind of over a decade and a half ago at a conference uh, a couple of magistrates came up and said well we're not social workers <laughs> we're judicial officers And so a sense that they were concerned not to blur the role to what they saw as another kind of profession, another kind of occupation. So I think there is perhaps struggles around the identity of what it means to be a judicial officer in the lower courts in the 21st century. But also that struggle with impartiality, the association with releasing emotion and being less than partial. The, 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 the kind of idea that you can't be impartial if you release emotion, you'd be, be perceived as something different. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think impartiality is a really interesting question and depending on kind of how you think about what impartiality is uh, and whether displaying some um, emotion or showing some empathy means you're being less impartial mm. or perhaps someone might say more impartial that you're really getting the full stories uh, rather than just uh, what's being presented by lawyers or others. So um, I think often impartiality is couched as as excising emotion mm. completely. Mm. Um, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit more tonight. <laughs> look forward um, to that. But it, it, is a, it is a real question because sometimes emotion is associated with bias. But that's not necessarily the case. Just because you express emotion or you empathise doesn't necessarily mean that your decision is going to be in favour of a particular party. And I think um, certainly the judges and magistrates that we talk to would, would make that distinction fairly clearly, at least in their minds. And I think it's another question uh, about whether it's really possible to do that. Mm. You could say, well, yes, now I move emotion aside and now I'm going to make my impartial decision. Is it entirely possible to say, okay, that is over and now I'm in this space and it's completely separate from the space I was in before? I think that's a really interesting question. Yes, it really is. The, one of the things I want to return to just before we finish, but I, I'd like to return to this idea of when... When you talk about the magistrates, you identify them as male or female. Every time you speak about a quote, you talk about a male magistrate or a female magistrate. And I'm just wondering, I know your initial research was about the gendered experience in in in-house lawyers, and I was wondering whether there is also a gendered experience within the magistrate. I think the gendered experience... um happens less at work and more at home, Uh, perhaps not surprisingly. Uh, I I mean, it has been a really big question about whether the entry of women into the judiciary will make a difference. Mm -hmm. In Australia, we've started tracking uh, women in the judiciary since about um, 2000. And I think there were about 17% of all judicial officers in 2000 were women. Uh, And that has gone up to a third, and now it's kind of paralleled. And there's been a lot of debates about whether or not this will make a difference. Mm. And so I, I, I won't go into all of those. But from our research, certainly gender seemed to be a, make a difference in, in some very small ways. It is not possible to say all men think this and all women think that. It is much more nuanced. Um, I think 
in terms of some of the approaches and some of the skills, women value them slightly more than men. Um, but overall, men and women are first and foremost judicial officers. And so we didn't find a whole lot of difference between the approaches or the and we didn't look at decisions, the outcomes. Mm -hmm. We didn't find a whole lot of difference. And and certainly in the interviews, if you say, well, you know, here's a woman who says that, I can also find a man who says something similar. Um, so it is. So there is variation. The big difference is in terms of home life, and in terms of domestic responsibilities. And it, it was a real surprise. And in our surveys, we asked. Uh, some questions about who does what kind of work at home, um, which did raise a few eyebrows when we first um, talked about doing the survey. And by and large, in Australia, people don't contract out um, household activities. People have perhaps a, someone who comes and cleans or does a garden if they have gardens, but we don't have kind of live-in um, Housekeepers, housekeepers not, not, not unless you're very, very wealthy. Mm. Um, and there might be some, so a few exceptions to that broad generalisation. So what was really surprising to us is the extent to which women still undertake kind of traditional female roles mm. in the household and that for male judges it's typically their um, partners who take, take responsibility mm. for all kinds of household activities. Also, um, you know, even if there are other people to come into the home and, and do things, that needs to be organised and managed as well. It's not like, you know, everything kind of disappears. It, it kind of doesn't. Uh, so that is a, a, a really big difference. And I think that there would be, um, in the interviews, a, a more a sense of the women making a distinction between their their job and their home life. You know, some would say, I walk out the door and I become mum, yeah. or I, um, I I become myself, I become a friend, I, I am, I'm not a judge. Uh, we have a great quote from um, a, a woman who said, you know, my husband are chalk and cheese, and, and both she and her husband are judicial officer. He comes home and talks about the day, he said, she said, this happened, Etc. Etc. And she comes home and said, "I don't do any of that, um, and I don't bring work home. My husband brings work home, and I tell the children, um, Daddy's got homework just mm -hmm. like you.'" And this quote has been really interesting. A, a number of people think, uh, "Does that show that she's particularly well organised, mm -hmm. or does that show that she accepts a, gen a very gendered division of mm -hmm. labour in the household?" But she said in the interview, you know, I don't want my children saying, mummy's always tired. She never has time um, to kind of, uh, you know, help us with our homework or, or do whatever. So it was a very interesting, um, almost in, in her reporting, I mean, I did not talk to her husband, I don't think. I may have, I don't know, um, to get his view of that. Uh, but the idea that, uh, and many of the male judges talked about, you know, after dinner I would go to my study. There was no sense of after dinner there's kind of dishes to do and homework to help with and organising for tomorrow and packing school. They didn't talk about that, but the, we the women did talk about the things they had to do, the home-related things that they did, whereas men were able to kind of retire. Mm. There was also an interesting kind of theme, um, or almost sub-theme, of some of the, the uh, women in particular, and they stick in my mind, so I, I can't say this definitively, kind of almost wanting to um, protect their family mm. from some of the things and the emotional dimensions of the day. Um, and whereas I, I don't know that, that men were that aware of it, but saying, you know, I, I just want to draw a line, mm. I want to go and, and not uh, talk about some of the, the things I've had to, to think about and deal with and decide on today. But that almost feeds full circle because at one point you talked to, about a female magistrate putting her, letting the emotions happen, putting them aside, and then dealing with the issue of times. And, and, Again, about female 
magistrates being able to distance themselves from that job and and being kind of almost two separate identities yeah, yeah. and i wonder if that theme pervades through whether the idea that the female magistrate has that ability to kind of make very distinct and clear lines between their decision making and their family and home life mm -hmm. and perhaps that's what's going on maybe we're better at separation maybe 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 and and i wonder whether it's that we're better at separation or that is the expectations mm. and that the expectations are different and so it's okay oh, daddy can yeah. bring work home that's fine because that's normal mm. men men do that um, but when women are at home, they're doing kind of traditionally women's things in terms of the the social expectations. So I think it's a, it's a it's a really it's a really difficult um, struggle and challenge. Yeah, I think absolutely. for for many women in 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 their their um, in, role. In, in any role really. Mm. Um, and I I remember another. Um, Magistrate saying, "Well, you know, I'm, I, you know, it's difficult for me. I'm privileged. I'm, I'm not a woman working in a checkout at a supermarket. I mean, I do have more flexibility. I do have more control. And I guess that that's another theme of, of professional occupations mm -hmm. that people in professions do have more flexibility and more control mm -hmm. over when they do things, how they do things, um, than than people in many other kinds of jobs mm -hmm. who are also." struggling to kind of manage yeah. family and work mm. and social expectations. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it also brings us back to this idea of emotion as well. I'm wondering if if those gendered uh, life expectations, so our, our different expectations from male and female magistrate, would also be um, pervade our understanding of how they deal with emotion in the courtroom, whether there's an expectation of them to deal with emotion differently within that courtroom. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know that I can kind of go that far. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's also a piece of research that might involve talk with defendants or other court yeah. users or the lawyers who are in the court. And our research so far has not done that. Okay. So our, our research is really focused on the judicial officer and the court, and mostly from the point of view of the judicial sure. officer in the court. But I think, uh, you know, perhaps this is a, a call to arms if anybody <laughs> else is interested in doing some research to look at the way in which courtroom participants, whether they're from the, prof you know, the legal profession or whether they're um, lay people, whether they have particular particular expectations which might be gendered around uh, what they think the judge or magistrate is going to say or do. And that brings us beautifully, Sharon, to your talk this evening on judging an emotion and I certainly am looking forward to hearing it. But for those who won't be here this evening, could you give us a brief synopsis of what this evening will hold? Okay, well I'm going to start by making the point that it is very unusual to put those terms together, emotion and judging. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is the case, what's the model of judging, which means that emotion should be excised. Then I'm going to largely talk about the research that I've been involved with, with Kathy Mack over the past decade and, and a half. And I'm going to then kind of end on a, a note that thinks about, in a more macro way, what's the relationship between law and society. So try and think about the interrelationship between judging and emotion to consider kind of more broader things about the role of emotion, the role of law, and the intersection between law and society. And I've been delighted to be uh, invited to do this public lecture for the Cardiff School of Law and Politics. And I just hope that uh, people will be able to think of examples or that it might resonate uh, with people's experiences here of life in the courts and for judicial officers. Thank you so much, Sharon, for coming today. We've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I hope others will too. And I really look forward to this evening. And thank you for the conversation also. I feel like it's just been a regular chat and it's been wonderful. Thank you for your questions, Rachel.